Well, he didn't look like much, and the team definitely needed much. The season before, they had been 2-14. and 14. They had traded away their first-round draft pick, and the scout said of him, he had a weak arm, was skinny, and looked like a Swedish place kicker. He didn't look like much, and that team needed much. Sixteen years later, four Super Bowl rings, being called the greatest quarterback of all time at that time, and with his ticket punch to the Hall of Fame in Canton, Joe Montana retired. He didn't look like much, but when he entered the equation of the San Francisco 49ers, everything changed. You know, Jesus didn't look a whole lot like much. When he crossed that hill and he crowned the top of the Mount of Olives, and he came down into Jerusalem riding that donkey, well, he didn't look like much. But when Jesus enters the equation, everything changes. Today's a day where Christians throughout the world celebrate Palm Sunday. They celebrate that triumphal entry. When Jesus enters the equation then, and when He enters the equation in our life today, you better believe that everything changes. The story of the triumphal entry, well, it's marked by three things. A prediction, a procurement, and a procession. We begin with the prediction. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, He took the twelve disciples aside. And on the way He said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn Him to death and deliver Him over to the Romans, the Gentiles, to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And yet, He will be. Jesus referring to Himself, He will be raised on the third day. That's a prediction. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. And now we get to the procurement of the transportation and also to that great procession of triumph. We want to turn to our eyewitness Bible series. My heartfelt, as well as our church, our appreciation goes out to one of our members, Phil Smith, who's been working on this little mini-movie for uh, the better parts of, well, months, several months. When the Holy Spirit began to work through this process, we thought it was just going to be something for our church family to enjoy. But over the past week with this video, this mini-movie being posted on Right Now Media and version as well, it was dozens and hundreds and now thousands of churches have entertained the notion that this would be a part of their Palm Sunday. And so without any further ado, let's watch The Need together. I'm married to a cat lady. Yeah, you know the type. I don't have to explain. Well, a cat lady, except with donkeys. Um, a donkey lady. In the Christian tradition, Palm Sunday is one week before Easter Sunday. It commemorates the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem for what we today call Passion or Holy Week. It is the defining event that begins the countdown of Jesus' time on earth. We live in Bethphage, my wife and I. It's a small village about halfway from Bethany to Jerusalem. It's on the east side of the Mount of Olives. It's not far from the mountaintop. We're not rich, not poor. We're as normal as normal can be. We own a small shop that sells firewood for camping to pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. Our most valuable possession, however, a donkey. Kind of an older donkey, and her foal. It's nearly weaned, never been ridden, and still follows its mother around. Yes, I'm irritated at my wife. Wean it, break it, and the colt is worth more. But my wife, it's like it's her precious child. She treats it like a precious child. She won't let me train it, won't even let me touch it. Donkey lady. 
We make extra money by renting out the donkey to those who are fatigued from walking up the Mount of Olives. And it would double if I could rent out that colt. Traffic has increased due to, um, well, let's just say these are exciting and dangerous times. Weeks ago, uh, less than three miles from here in the village of Bethany, Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. I mean, I, I don't know. It's the story and you don't go making things up like that. Lots of people hope to see Lazarus and uh, you know, verify what's happened to him. It's a pretty big deal. He was dead for days, four, I'm pretty sure. Um, so that's the exciting part. The dangerous, well, I've heard some of the travelers are looking for ways to kill Lazarus, eliminate any trace of Jesus' ability to raise people from the dead. It's just what I've heard. So it's the Sunday before Passover, already a steady stream of people on the road through a village coming from the countryside to Jerusalem to celebrate. The uh, donkey lady and I are outside preparing to paint some lamb's blood above the door frame and on either side. We've got our hyssop branches to use as paint brushes. This is not a required part of modern Passover activities, but you know, we like the, the reminder of the Passover story from Exodus. We hear a noise behind us, turn around, two men untying our donkey and the foal stealing in broad daylight. Hey, I shout, and they freeze. They just stare, what are you doing? can't believe how brazen. I mean, who do you think you are? Right there, right in front of our eyes. I'm getting all amped. You know, I'm a strong guy. I, uh, I chop wood for a living. Size point. This is not happening. No, sir. Not today. Right? One of them says, and his, his voice uh, so soft, well, the Lord needs it. He'll send it back soon. It's like an angel has closed my mouth. I can't say anything. I look at donkey lady. <laughs> she looks at me. We just nod our heads and the men walk away with our most valuable possessions, her precious baby. So a little while later, we hear a shout in the distance toward Bethany and then a crowd comes into view, heading straight toward us, and we can hardly believe our eyes. Some guy is leading our donkey. Behind him, another man rides on our colt, robes draped over the colt like blankets, and he's sitting on top. We expect the colt to bolt toward us, to, to its home, to its manger, you know, to feed. And the colt stays calm, follows its mother, passes us, heads toward Jerusalem, and a huge crowd follows the donkeys. I, you know, I want an explanation. I pull this man aside. He's reluctant to stop and lose his place, so I walk with him. He tells me the man on the colt is Jesus. And behind him, his apostles and Lazarus. And then all the crowds of people, and, and some are the ones from Jerusalem who went to verify Lazarus is alive. Some are Passover pilgrims on the way to Jerusalem. Many look like they're from Galilee. Others are local from Bethany. And I walk to Donkey Lady, who is smiling from ear to ear, by the way, and I point. It's the Lord. It's, it's Jesus. She just beams. He needs, he needs our donkey. And it's like a punch to the gut. Can this be the Messiah? The Lord who created the universe and needs something? He needs something that we can give him? Ordinary people, a, a donkey lady and her husband meeting the Lord's need? I race to catch up with my donkeys, with Jesus. I reach him just as he crests the Mount of Olives and comes to a stop. And the noise of the crowd washes over and down the west side of the Mount of Olives. The uproar 
crashes into the Kidron Valley and onto the east side of the Temple Mount, echoing back to the Mount of Olives over an area so large, hundreds of acres with thousands of campfires. They smoke like pots of incense, fires of sacrifice. And the sun behind us reflects off of the Golden Temple in front of us through the smoke of more fires of sacrifice. Jesus rides down the west side of the Mount of Olives and people throw palm branches onto the path in front of him. And some throw their cloaks on the ground and the crowds nearest Jesus, they're just, they're delirious with joy. And some of us know and some of us don't, but Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah and Zechariah about the King of Israel entering Jerusalem. And, and our unridden cult is a critical piece of the prophecy. Jesus needed our cult to fulfill prophecy. The people around the fires in the huge valley, they look up at Jesus and they see him as their king, their Messiah. They cheer, chant, chant verses from the scriptures. Hosanna, blessed is is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Hosanna to the son of David. And Jesus goes down the steep path and the sound of the thousands of people, it's, it's overwhelming. Some of the Pharisees at the front of the crowd, you know, they're furious. They know the crowd is acknowledging Jesus is the Messiah. They rebuke Jesus. They try to get him to quiet the crowd. The look on his face, I can only describe as sublime. He says, If the crowd is made to be quiet, the very stones on the ground will shout out. When the triumphant crowd approaches Jerusalem, and Jesus steps down from the donkey full and uh, quietly tells one of his apostles, take it back to its owner. I mean, I hear him. So I step up. I take my two donkeys. Jesus smiles and, and he says four words to me. You met my need. Why is donkey lady not with me? What? moment and I'm I'm gonna have to go back and try to recreate it for her. so I start back to the house and uh, the crowd stops Jesus sits on the ground and I'm pretty certain he's he's crying I only hear a few tearful words a lament over Jerusalem and then I'm swallowed up by the crowd I reach home I hug her. She is the reason we were able to meet the Lord's need. And I tell her that. She was right to keep the cult unridden. I tell her that. I tell my wife. We keep track of Jesus over the next several weeks. It's hard to do, not because of lack of information, but because it's hard to tell truth from fiction. For the first week, Jesus teaches at the temple every day, always in conflict with the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders finally have enough, and they arrest Jesus, and they arrange for the Romans to execute him. Crucifixion. The body of Jesus disappears. The Jewish leaders say that his apostles stole the body. The rumor among the people is that Jesus rose from the dead. And then reports that Jesus is seen by hundreds of people, not just his followers. He is seen in Jerusalem and in Galilee. It's been about seven weeks since Jesus rode our donkey, and we've decided to keep the cult, to never, never let it be written again. Well, my wife still treats it like a precious child. For seven Sundays, I leave the cult to the top of the Mount of Olives. I relive in detail, 
every moment of the day we met the need of Jesus. When I come to the top of the mountain, I just, I just stand there, remembering the fires and the shouts, the palm leaves on the path. And then I return home with a feeling of disappointment for six Sundays. But on the seventh Sunday, in the distance is a group of men. I take the colt and we go. And as we get close, I see it's Jesus with his apostles. I am only about a stone's throw away. And Jesus starts rising in the air. He goes into the clouds and disappears. I walk toward the apostles and there are these two men in dazzling white clothes approaching. Galileans, why are you standing there looking into the sky? This same Jesus will return in the same way he went into heaven. The apostles break out in praise and happiness and they, and they smile at me. They remember the cult. At least I, I think they do, but then they head to Jerusalem. I return home with the cult to my wife, he's gone now. He's really gone. I tell her of the story of Jesus rising in the air. She doesn't even seem surprised. We were willing to meet his need, she says. And many people were blessed. I know that should make me feel better, but I'm, I'm sad that he's gone. Now, we will meet the needs of his followers, she says. I'm so glad I married a donkey lady. Jesus says when we help others in his name, we are helping him, meeting his need. Meeting the need of the Lord God of the universe. Jesus has a need. His need comes from his desire. His desire to enter into the lives of others and change everything. The question today is will we meet his need? Will we be the answer to his desire? Will we allow Jesus to work through us to help others? To be that light that he talked about. To be that salt that he talked about. That salt that saves, that salt that makes that enormous and counts for everything difference in the lives of others. Real quick this morning, four quick points as we spell out the word salt and how we can be people who meet Jesus' need, who answer His heart of hearts, His desire to through us make a difference and be salt to others. Number one, letter S, Pray for salvation. Matthew 21 and 9 of the story of Palm Sunday. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The word Hosanna means, Lord, save us now. Has that word ever had more implication and more power than it does for today? We're praying, we're pleading, we're begging, we're asking in respectful tones. Lord, save us, save our world now. We're praying for healing. We're praying for His strength. We're praying for His salvation. We're praying for His deliverance. Now if you will for just a moment dive deep with me into that word, Hosanna. Hosanna, a verb, a statement of, Lord, would you be about the action of saving us now? It's a word that as we read it in the Bible in Psalm 118 and in the Gospels, as Jesus makes that triumphal entry, it's moved from an action statement, a verb statement, into a proper name. 
We're calling Him Hosanna in the highest. And as you look at Scripture and as you understand as we dive deep into this Word, that only makes sense. Because from this word Hosanna, this old Hebrew word in the Psalms, come three proper names throughout the rest of Scripture. The prophet Hosea that preached God's salvation. Well, his name, Hosea, Hosea, Hosanna, you can kind of even see the similarities. His name means the Lord saves. And then there would be this one that the Bible speaks of in Numbers 13 and verse 16. His name was Yeshua, Joshua. But before Jesus, or excuse me, before Joseph, uh, excuse me, one more time, before Moses changes his name to Joshua, his name is Hoshea, Hosanna, Hosea, the son of Nun, Hoshea. His name is also Joshua, the Lord who saves. And then Joshua would have this one named after him who would take his name, Joshua, Yeshua, our word, Jesus. In his name, Matthew 1 and 21. And they will call him Jesus, for he will save his people. No wonder the name Hosanna has now become not just a plea for God to take action, it's become His name, Hosanna in the highest. When those people on Palm Sunday at the triumphal entry were crying out, Hosanna to Jesus, they were literally crying out His name. He is then and today the personification of God's salvation. And if you want to be salt in this world, you cry out, you beg, you ask, you pray, number one, that God's power would step in and save the day. It's something we should all be praying for daily now. You know, I'm mindful that as those people were crying out, God save, as they were crying out, Jesus, would you do something? We're begging, we're asking, we're pleading. They were begging for God to deal with a sickness and a disease that was known as Rome. They wanted an outward, an external oppression to be done away with. But what Jesus would come to really address, Matthew 1 and 21 to finish it out, and His name will be Jesus because He will save His people, not from Rome, but from a far greater disease, from their sins. We need to be mindful in this time where we're crying out for God to deliver us from a virus. That we would remember and we would recall and recognize that there is another virus that has infected every last one of us. And it is that virus sin that Jesus has come ultimately to deal with. And so we pray as people who would be different makers, as we pray for people who are salt, Number one, for salvation. Number two, letter A, we pray for His attitude to take hold in our lives. Other emperors, other kings at that time, when they would ride into a city to be acknowledged, Vespian into Rome, after the conquest of Jerusalem, there were armies and regalia and floats depicting the battle, and all glory to Him, Jesus and His attitude, the attitude that we desire to have, He comes lowly. He comes riding on a donkey, not on a war horse. He comes as one who brings an attitude of servanthood, of peace. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. May we live this out as well. May this be our attitude. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. In this season where so many of us, all of us are, are cooped up and we begin to get a little bit of cabin fever, may we have that attitude of Christ. May we be people where we don't think so much less of ourselves, but we just think of ourselves less. Thinking more of others, having that attitude of Christ. And so we pray for salvation. We try to have that attitude of Christ. And number three, letter L, as salt, let us be about the business of loving acts. I could go on and on about when Jesus 
riding in on that donkey and the palms are being laid down at that triumphal entry, how there was no greater act of love before or since that has ever been lived out. But I want to focus in for a moment on one little word. It's interesting that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they record the story of the two disciples being sent into the village and being told what to say, our English translations say that they're to tell the owners of the donkey, the Lord needs it. And that word, the, is not a big word. But if you go back to the original language, there's another not big word there. But when you read it from the original language, it makes all the difference in the world. When those disciples show up and they go up to the owner of that, that donkey and its colt, they don't say the Lord needs it. They say, it's Lord needs it. Little word, but a big difference. What Jesus is doing here is He is employing the language of royal levy. It is His kingdom and everything in it is His. And it is not just that the Lord needs the donkey, it is that it's Lord. He owns the donkey. He is the prophet that sees the entire situation. He owns the situation. He is the king of the situation. And today may we understand that He is the King, that where we find ourselves, this is His kingdom, and we, like the donkey and all those things in His kingdom, we belong to Him. And just like that donkey, I have a job. And my job is to carry Jesus into the lives of others. And just like that donkey, He makes a promise. And I'll get you home. He told the owners of that donkey, and when he was done with its service, he would return it to its home. The other day I was talking to a dear brother in our church who was in his last couple of days. And as he was passing from this life, and it was his desire to leave the hospital, which would be granted, and to go back home to his family and be there with them in his last moments. As I was speaking to him on the phone, he said to me with a robust confidence as his voice gained strength and he said to me Mitch I'm ready to go home and I'm not talking about my home in Broken Arrow he understood that in the midst of his sickness that the Lord was king it was his kingdom and he belonged to the Lord and the Lord has promised in Christ to get him home someone right now says now Mitch what in the world does this have to do with loving acts it has everything to do with loving acts. Because I turn from a mindset of fear and panic and anxiety, and I understand that the Lord reigns, that He is King, that this is His kingdom, and that I belong to Him, and I've got a job to do in carrying Him to others, and at the end of that task, He has promised one day and most assuredly that He would return me and get me home. John says, that type of perfect love, understanding that you are perfectly loved, that drives out all fear. And today, being that salt, letter T number four, we understand we're about the business of testimony. We're about the business of having a life that has decided that we will carry Jesus to others in word and in deed. The Bible is full of donkey givers. Full of those who had so very little. But when the king shows up and he has need, they gladly hand it over. David gave his sling and a few stones. Moses gave his staff. Rahab gave her rope. The widow gave her might. Paul gave his pen and his scroll. Samson had a jawbone. Mary had an expensive jar of perfume. There were ten lepers, all were healed, but one came back and all he had to offer was a simple thank you. And Jesus took that thank you and he began to carry that into the lives of others. What is your donkey? What is your sacrifice? What is your gift? What is your life? 
What is the thing that you have where you can use that to carry Jesus to others? Today I've got two specific invitations for you today. If you are one who has given your life, your, your, your donkey, so to speak, your kingdom to Jesus Christ, today how can you be salt? How can you offer up that prayer of salvation, the attitude of Christ, the loving kindness, and the testimony? How can you be a difference maker and salt for others? Number two, invitation. If before you ever ask Jesus to work in you and through you, let me ask, have you ever invited Jesus to enter your life? It's this other virus, this virus of sin that he is ultimately concerned with. His name is Yeshua. His name is Hosanna. His name is salvation. And he is named this because he has come to save his people. Are you his people? Have you come and given your life to Him so that He can save you from your sins? I want to invite you today to seriously consider giving your life to the Lord in baptism. There were those that in Acts heard about Jesus and He became real to them in His offer of entering their lives. And they said, what, what can we do? What shall we do? And it very clearly states in God's Word that they are to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and also for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which makes all of these things we've laid out today in being salt possible. We can't do them on our own. And so whether this week you want to be one who uh, reaches out to us through uh, ministry at parkplaza.org and, and you say, I, I want to talk to someone about giving my life to Christ, being born of the Spirit in Him, having Him enter my life, uh, please let us know that through that email address. Maybe you're one who wants to reach out through a phone call. Maybe you can, if you can't take notes this quick, replay this quick part. My phone number is 918 521 2701. Please text me or call me. Your home sheltering with another. You've got a backyard pool. You've got a hot tub. You've got a bathtub. And you want to just talk about what this baptism thing is. Uh, you want to come up here to the building at some point. We can make sure that it's just a couple of us that come. You say, Mitch, I'm not big on, on doorknobs or buildings right now. Uh, back behind our house, if you bring up the picture of this creek that uh, the Lord has bordered along our property. Come on out, call me. Uh, no doorknobs, no buildings, nothing involved. I'll stand off, I'll get my camera. We'll do a virtual church service baptism. We'd love today, if it's been running through your mind about coming close to Christ, I pray you draw near Him so He may draw near you. Let's end our time in prayer this morning. Almighty God, as we begin to sing as we begin to pray to you in this song, Father, we pray that we would be salt, that we would be light, that, Father, you would use our lives, that, Father, we would address your need, your desire of making a difference in this world through us. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.